There's a new sheriff in town for Maryland men's basketball. Women's basketball's March Madness run ends in the Sweet 16 for the second straight year, and your Maryland men's lacrosse team refuses to lose. All that and more coming up on the Left Bench TV. Thank you for this opportunity. I will not let you down. Go Terps. Hello and welcome back to the Left Bench TV, your sideline source for all things Maryland sports. I'm Kevin McNulty. And I'm Katie Mark. Now students may have been gone for spring break, but that did not stop Maryland Athletics from breaking program records, venturing to Sweet 16s, and making one huge head coaching hire. You're right, Katie, and that's the first thing we'll get into today. Since Mark Turgeon departed the program in December and Danny Manning took over as interim head coach, everyone has had one question. Who's next? And that question has finally been answered. Kevin Willard is leaving Seton Hall and coming to College Park. Willard was introduced at a as coach at, pre at a press conference last Tuesday. Athletic Director Damon Evans said the Long Island native has been on his radar since December and everything came together once Willard's Pirates were knocked out of the NCAA tournament. Here's what Willard had to say about his new gig. This is one of the most unbelievable opportunities for, for me and my family. We are going to work every day. No one's going to outwork us. No one's going to grind us more. Uh, we have unbelievable support. It's an unbelievable university. I've been here. I've walked around. Uh, my promise to you is no one will outwork me. It just won't happen. No one's going to outwork my teams. They might have a better zone offense, and if you ask the Seton Hall fans, they will tell you everybody has a better zone offense than me. But I will work every day. My staff will work every day. We are going to have fun. We are going to bring the swag back to Maryland basketball, and we are going to win at a high level, and I promise you that. Thank you for this opportunity. I will not let you down. Go Terps. And we brought in TLB men's basketball beat writer Noah Ferguson to go over everything you need to know about what this new hire means for the program. Noah, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. And Noah, a lot has been made about how this new hire would be received by Terp fans. And, well, Willard had a lot of time to speak directly to them last week. How did he come across, and how do you expect Terp fans are going to love this new era of Maryland basketball? Yeah, guys, uh, K Kevin Willard, the biggest thing that he kind of stressed in that opening press conference is that he wants to bring the fun back to College Park. He wants to bring that, as he said, swag back to College Park and, and bring the excitement back into the Xfinity Center, something that, that uh, teams have been lacking recently uh, for, for the men's team. And he also he brought up that, that Maryland men's basketball is a top 10 job in the country. And, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big statement for, for a new coach to, to say. And he also brought up Gary Williams, who was in attendance actually at the press conference and, and, and kind of lauded all of his achievements. And, and so it was, uh, it, there was a lot, of, a lot of big statements made by Willard and it brought a lot of energy for, for Terps fans, something that this team needs energy going forward. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas that Willard's immediately going to be assessed in is recruiting in this region and elsewhere. What do you expect to see from him in terms of recruiting this year? Yeah, I mean, with with any new regime, new new coach, new coach, uh, there's going to be there's going to be overhaul with with coaching, with transfers. So he's he doesn't know what his team is going to be yet. Um, but 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 there's been some some positive signs, especially with recruiting in the DMV area, which is something that Terps fans uh, have been have been missing um, recently. Um, so I mean, he's he's hired new two new uh, assistant coaches already, and Tony Skin and David Cox, who are both guys that that can recruit the DMV very well. So uh, the recruiting is obviously uh, important for the short term for next season, but for if they, he wants to lay a groundwork for the next five to ten years, that's going to be something that he really needs to, to, to hammer home. And Noah, I'm sure a lot of fans are curious about the style of play that Willard brings with him. And what can you say about his coaching style and how that will translate to Maryland in the Big Ten? Yeah, well, uh, with 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 you know the 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 player, we don't know we don't know uh, who's going to be on the team next year. 
So we don't know exactly how they're going to play at the moment, but we do know from his track record is that his teams are gritty, they're hard-nosed, and they're hard-working. And that's, that's something that uh, Terps fans want to see from their team and, and something that I, I think that Willard really wants to stress going forward uh, f for his team and for the new uh, regime in College Park. All right, well, it is a new era in College Park. As we said, Noah, thank you so much for being here. Now, in the days since Willard was introduced as the Terps' new head coach, the athletic department has already been promoting season tickets for next season. With fan engagement a huge priority after this past year, our Alex Gary is here in the studio to show us how things looked during this rocky season and how it affected attendance in the Xfinity Center. Thanks, Katie. As the Kevin Willard era begins for Maryland basketball, the program leaves behind a 2021-2022 campaign that many fans would like to forget. As much as the team struggled to be the 21st seed that they were ranked to be in the preseason, Terps fans also struggled to show their support. As the Terps entered non-conference play, fans had high aspiration for Mark Turgeon's squad, consistently drawing a crowd of around 13,000. However, an early loss to George Mason derailed the Terps' top 25 hopes and led to dropping attendance. Despite a lackluster beginning to the season, the Terps drew a crowd of nearly 16,000 against Virginia Tech on Len Bias Night. This attendance spike was short-lived, however, as the departure of Turgeon dropped attendance under 10,000 for the first time in recent memory. Attendance slowly rose back to 11,000 as conference play began and remained steady throughout most of the season, except for spikes against Indiana, Penn State, and Ohio State, which saw attendance return to the 15,000 range. Throughout the season, the Terps drew smaller crowds consistently when compared to the attendance statistics of the three seasons prior, excluding the 2020-2021 season when no fans were allowed to attend. While this jump may seem pretty small compared to the other seasons, attendance at Xfinity Center was down more than 2,000 fans per game from 2019-2020, and Maryland's men's game averaged nearly 1,000 less fans than 2018-2019 which had been their worst season attendance-wise in the past five years. As sporadic as the attendance was for the 2021-2022 season, it ultimately fell short of previous seasons for one reason, success on the court. The previous four had seen a gradual increase in attendance as the season went on. As the men's basketball program looks to put this season in the past and move into the Kevin Willard era, attendance may be a key factor in determining Willard's success in the eyes of the fans. Guys? Thank you, Alex. And recently, Big Ten men's basketball has been known for flopping in the NCAA tournament. Not by physically flopping on the court, but by not advancing very far in March. Last year, Maryland was one of nine Big Ten teams in the tourney, and Michigan was the only team to advance to the Sweet 16. Yeah, Kevin, and the conference's struggles weren't resolved this year either. The, the conference received nine bids once again, but only Michigan and Purdue made it to the second weekend. Let's go around the Big Ten to see how these teams fared over the weekend. The Wolverines were playing in their fifth straight Sweet 16, but Colin Gillespie and Villanova suffocated them with their defense. The Wildcats made some noise on the offensive end as well, including Eric Dixon, who put them up nine early in the second half. Then Michigan would creep back in, but Gillespie delivered the dagger with under two minutes to go, sending Jawan Howard's team packing. On Friday, it was Purdue's time to take on America's team, the St. Peter's Peacocks, who became the first ever 15 seed to advance to the Elite Eight. Purdue had the size and frankly talent advantage against the Peacocks, but none of that mattered. Happy National Peacock Day to Clarence Rupert, who knocks down the tray from the top of the key to keep St. Peter's in the game early. And the Peacocks kept letting it fly in the first half. College basketball's newest heartthrob, Doug Eddard, from deep to tie it up. The Boilermakers had the lead for some time in the second half, but Shaheen Holloway's guys wouldn't give up. Late in the game, Eddard hit clutch free throws, but Purdue had a chance. Jaden Ivey pulling up 4-3 to tie it, but it's off the mark and the Peacocks kept on strutting to the Elite Eight. And Katie, of course, St. Peter's run came to an end on Sunday against North Carolina, but what a run it was, captivated the whole country for about 10 days there. Oh, 100%. And as someone from New Jersey, I can confirm that New Jersey Twitter was going insane for St. Peter's. So congrats to them on a great run, making history as a 15 seed going to the Elite Eight. Hey, Jersey, yay. Hey. Represent. <laughs> 
And now the Big Ten didn't struggle nearly as much on the women's side. The conference had four teams represented in the Sweet 16 for the second consecutive year, including your fourth-seeded Maryland Terrapins. After running Delaware and Florida Gulf Coast out of the gym in the first and second rounds, Brenda Fries and her team journeyed west to Spokane, where they faced Stanford, and their luck ran out. The defending national champions controlled this one from the opening tip. The Cardinal were draining threes from the wing. Then they were draining threes from the corner, and Maryland just couldn't catch up. Playing with a mostly healthy squad for seemingly the first time all season wasn't enough as the Terps were outlasted on both ends of the floor. They made a push late in the second half, but it was too little, too late. Maryland got knocked out of the round of 16, 72 to 66. And Katie, while Brenda Fries' team didn't advance quite as far as they would have liked this season, they can't be too upset with a Sweet 16 berth after all they went through this year. Oh, 100%. And Brenda Fries said right after the game, she believes Stanford is the best team in the country, no argument. So between all the illnesses, injury, and tragedy, it's great what they were able to do with what they were given. Still a lot of fun to watch, too. Oh, 100%. And while most winter teams have wrapped up their seasons here in College Park, we've still got one going. The 20th-ranked Maryland gymnastics team is in the thick of their postseason. Now, the Big Ten is a stacked conference in gymnastics of ranked teams, so the Terps had their work cut out for them when they headed to Columbus for the Big Ten championships. Alexis Rubio has stunned on the vault all season, and that stayed the same, leading the vault team with a clean 9.9. And when you think of the bar squad, you probably think of Emma Silberman. Silves notched a 9.9 alongside Aleka Chikneus, who's also been stellar on bars this year. And here comes the freshman, Josephine Kogler, possibly crowning herself as the new beam queen of the Gym Terps. She led with a 9.825. And everyone's favorite all-arounder, Audrey Barber, secured a 9.9 on the floor, also tying for the highest score in the all-around in the first session of the weekend. Barber, who you may know is now Maryland's all-time leading scorer, was recently named a second-team All-American in the all-around. The intimidation of strong conference opponents only pushed the Gym Terps further as they secured a score of 196.45 by the end of the weekend, the program's best score in the Big Ten Championships since joining the conference in 2014. They play six in the meet overall. Brett Nelligan's squad will continue its postseason run as it heads to Raleigh on Thursday for the NCAA Regionals, where they will face the winner of North Carolina and Towson, number 14 UCLA, and the reigning national champs in number three Michigan. That'll start up on Thursday. And while we still have plenty more in store for you, and coming up we'll talk all things Maryland lacrosse with our lax beat writers. And as always, your top five plays, Pro Terp, Terp of the Week, and much more. Don't go anywhere. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. Welcome back to the Left Bench TV. Crab cakes and lacrosse, that's what Maryland does. And Kevin, I heard that Maryland men's lacrosse took the program to new heights over a familiar foe recently. Yeah, you're right, and that foe was Virginia, which is a state not known for its crab cakes, but certainly known for its stellar college lacrosse team over the past couple of years. And 10 days ago, the number one ranked Terps were able to avenge their national championship loss from a year ago by beating the Cavaliers at their own game. The revenge was sweet for Maryland men's lacrosse on Saturday. Having 11 different players contribute to the scoring effort may have been even sweeter. With 47 combined goals over the past two games, the Terps offense has been firing on all cylinders. But they received an added boost from their midfielders and defenders who produced more offense than usual. It was those unexpected transition goals that prevented Virginia from getting back into it. That, that was startling, that uh, the transition game, how many goals they had from that. Um, we usually dictate the tempo, and um, yeah, that it was, it was certainly give them a lot of credit for that. Virginia is known for its strength in transition, but with guys like Roman Puglisi, Brett Maycar, and Matt Rahill combining for four goals on Saturday, the Terps showed they can turn a ground ball into a goal with ease. 
Makar charged the net with authority in the second quarter for his first career goal, and he's a senior. That one put Maryland up five, and he was absolutely hyped. Ray Hill later added a 60-yard bullet when Virginia switched to a 10-man ride in the second half. If you don't practice and your defensive guys don't practice that stuff, like there'll be opportunities and you want to maximize those opportunities. Um, so those are things those guys practice. And Puglisi, well, he secured his first multi-goal game of the season, both part of an eight-goal Maryland fourth. But for Tillman, the Terps' tempo all started at the face-off X, where Luke Weirman and his wings went 24 for 36. It, it all started with, in the middle of the field, Luke Weirman, what he did, uh, the wing guys, those guys were tremendous. And I just think that was going to be something that really getting those extra possessions, you know, allowed us to get in the rhythm. And Katie, those two teams were neck and neck in that national championship game a year ago. This one wasn't even close. 11 goals in the end, Maryland won by. They look so good right now. Oh yeah, I was expecting a much closer game this time, given 17 to 16 last year. This year was a blowout, so good for them for getting some revenge there. And they kept it going. Absolutely. And the Terps had seven full days off in between their beatdown of Virginia and their Big Ten opener at Penn State. And to no surprise, that was a beatdown as well. Temperatures were in the 20s Sunday night in Happy Valley, but the hard shells were still on fire. Jack Chorus from Logan Wisnowskis, money. Then it was Keegan Kahn going unassisted to put Maryland up a pair, and there was no looking back. After being up 5-3 in the second quarter, the Terps scored 13, yes, 13 unanswered goals, helping them sail to a 1-0 record in Big Ten play. Kahn, Kyle Long, and sophomore Eric Molliver all finished the game with hat tricks. Here's Coach Tillman on how important it is for his younger players to have those vets to look up to. We put a lot on the older guys, um, you know, to try to help the younger guys. And, and, you know, the old saying, like, leave it better than you found it, and leave a legacy. And, um, you know, for those guys, it's not just scoring goals and, and making plays during the game. There's a lot of knowledge and experience that those guys can pass on to the younger guys. And um, to me, that's, that's, that's part of your responsibility, you know, as an older brother and a mentor. And now we're very excited to be joined by our men's lacrosse beat writer, Logan Hill. And Logan, I don't think it would be a TLB TV episode without you here on the set. I know, it's starting to feel that way. <laughs> Absolutely not. And Logan, I hear you've got a game of Guess That Stat for us today. I do, and it's actually Guess That Stat, true or false edition. I figured after last time, we'll make it a little bit easier for on air production. So, I mean, let's just, are you guys ready to get started? Yeah, let's do yeah, it. We were so, me, against, me against Katie, right? Yep, yeah. it's going to be okay. you guys versus each other, and you just got to give me true or false. All right. So, number one, uh, Luke Weirman has won more than two-thirds of his face-offs this season. True or false? I'm going to say that's true. I think it's true. Uh, uh, Luke Weirman's been playing outstanding this season. Yeah. yeah, I mean, outstanding isn't really even the word to cut it. That is true. He's won 130 of 190 face-offs, which is 68%. Dear top God. three in the nation as of yesterday. Um, number two, though. Coming into this week, Maryland men's lacrosse currently leads the nation in scoring offense, margin of victory, and assists per game. True or false? I'm going to say false just to be different. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say everything's true about this men's lacrosse team, right? Exactly. Uh, I mean, offensive production, the last two games have been just racking up the goals against Albany, Virginia, and Penn State, so I'm going to say it's true. You would be right, you would be wrong, Katie. Yeah. That one is true. They're also leading the nation <laughs> in adjusted offensive efficiency and shooting percentage. That one courtesy of Inside Lacrosse's Terry Foy. Then my last one I have for you guys here today is Sunday's win over Penn State was number 150 for John Tillman as head coach in Maryland. Is that true or is that false? I'm going to say false. I'm also going to say false. Just by doing the math, Tillman's been here 11, 12 years. Uh, went to the national championship game last year and still won 15 games. Um, it might be, it might actually be close, but I'm going to go with false. Okay, so nobody got them all right today. That one was true. That win last night makes, or excuse me, Sunday night makes Tillman 150 and 40 all time at Maryland and 170 and 59 all time as a coach. Victorious in my guess that stat <laughs> debut. Huge had, day. Had to be different, I guess. <laughs> Be sure to keep up with all of Logan's coverage of the Hard Shells on Twitter and online at theleftbench.com. Thanks for joining us, Logan. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, Logan. And then number three, Maryland women's lacrosse held its senior day on Saturday here in College Park. And while the pregame ceremony was full of smiles and cheers for Terp fans, the game was not. 
Maryland struggled to complete eight meter shots and they battled the Duke's aggressive offense throughout the game. James Madison's Isabella Peters had a field day against Maryland's defense, knocking in five of their goals and assisting on another. JMU's goalkeeper was on point in the second half, recording 10 saves as the Maryland offense fought to close the gap, which they were unable to do, resulting in a 13-8 loss. The Terps are roughly at the halfway point in the season and will be taking on local opponent Georgetown this Wednesday as they look to shake off the tough senior day loss. Now that the Terps are in the thick of their season and almost ready to continue conference play, we thought we'd bring in yet another one of our TLB lacrosse beat writers. And this time, it's Ben Strober, who covers women's lacs for us at theleftbench.com. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. And well, first things first, the team suffered its first loss on Saturday to JMU, and how do you think that might change the course of the season for the Terps? Well, you know, it's kind of brutal for them as a team because, you know, they played so hot all year long. You know, obviously it was their first loss this season. And when they play at home, I mean, that was only Kathy Reese's, you know, fifth loss ever at home in her tenure. I mean, that's a team with super high expectations every year. I mean, they went to 11 straight Final Fours and then after having, you know, kind of two down years. But, you know, they got transfers this year like Aurora Accordingly, Abby Bosco, and people like that, you know, they've, been, they've had really high expectations. So for them to fall short, against James Madison is definitely a little disappointing, but they're going to have to rebound from that. And I think, you know, they're going to be ready because after the game, Libby May said, we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead, the Terps are slated to play four teams currently ranked in the top 20 in Johns Hopkins, Princeton, Northwestern, and Michigan. What do they have to focus on now in order to win those ranked matchups? So uh, as we saw last game, you know, they were really struggled on the eight meter. They went one of eight on free position shots, which is just something that they don't do often. And, you know, that was really the difference in the game, you know. Kathy Reese really stressed how important it was. So I think in practice, they're definitely going to have to work on those eight meter shots because Kathy Reese wants that team to shoot over 50% every single game. And when they're just unable to do that, you know, they've really struggled so far. But I think defensively, they've been solid still. You know, they've been one of the better teams in all of college across on the clear and the ride. It's just a matter of, you know, putting it all together, uh, you know, staying hot offensively because a lot of teams now are putting a huge emphasis on Aurora accordingly, you know, trying to keep her off the scoreboard. So it's going to be up to everyone else to step up in a big way for them. And Ben, we know all about Aurora accordingly and what she's done transferring over here in just nine games. But who else has impressed you besides accordingly in the first nine games of the year? Well, I think someone that's not talked about enough is uh, Hannah Lubecker. I mean, she's actually kind of catching up to accordingly right now in the goals. I mean, accordingly was really hot, kind of starting in the beginning of the season, getting, you know, in the breaking away with the goal record, but Lou Becker's been catching up, you know, as more attention defensively has been focused on Corey. I mean, Lou Becker's really stepped up in a big way, but I think offensively, they're just, they're so deep. They have so many people that can score on any given play, but I think to answer that question, it's going to be Lou Becker. Mm -hmm. Well, Ben, that's all we've got for you, but thank you so much for coming on, and you can catch the Terps back in action on Wednesday in D.C. as they take on Georgetown at 7 p.m. Thanks again, Ben. Thank you for having me on here. And don't go anywhere because when we come back, we'll be crowning your Terp of the Week, Pro Terp, along with showcasing the top five plays of the week. And the topic of mental health in college athletics is bigger than ever these days, so we'll have more on what resources student athletes can use for help and hear from one Maryland athlete that's speaking out for change. When I was in foster care, I never knew when I would have to move. So I always had my suitcase ready to go. Then one day, I was adopted. My new parents opened their hearts and home to me. My parents cook my favorite breakfast for me every morning. My parents take me on trips I never thought I would go on. They gave me a home and an even better reason to use that suitcase. My parents aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. Welcome back once again to the Left Bench TV, and Katie, it's time to talk some baseball. Yes, it is. The Dirty Terps are now 18-5 and five on the season, but Kevin, I heard they're no longer in the top 25 following their latest weekend series. Yeah, you're right. Maryland dropped its first three-game set of the year, and it was actually their first weekend series loss in nearly a year. Rob Vaughn and company were down in Texas to take on the number one rated team in the RPI, Dallas Baptist. Maryland fell 8-3 on Friday, came back with a huge 11-5 win on Saturday, setting up the rubber match on Sunday. 
Maxwell Costas, what does he do? He hits dingers. The first baseman started things off with a homer in the second inning, putting him in third place on the program's all-time home run list at 33. But Dallas Baptist held the Terps scoreless until the seventh, when Kevin Keister added another four-bagger to the board. By the top of the ninth, the Patriots had built up a three-run lead, but then Bobby Smarslack, Luke Schliger, and Sean Laid loaded the bases for Chris Aileen, giving Maryland a golden opportunity at a comeback. But Aileen lined out, and the Terps left Texas with just the win on Saturday. Maryland will be back in action today, hosting local foe Towson at 4 p.m. Then they'll head to George Mason on Wednesday and host Penn State at home this weekend. Now the Dirty Terps might have lost this last series, but that doesn't mean they haven't been off to one heck of a start this season. And one Terp that's been helping fuel that, pitcher Ryan Ramsey. Here's Ramsey signing some autographs for some kids after Saturday's win. Love to see that, but to the pitcher's mouth. Ramsey is now 6-0, leading Big Ten pitchers in wins this year. He's got a 2-11 ERA and a .97 whip this season. In his last three games, Ramsey threw for a total of 19 innings with 27 strikeouts and only one run. He's earned a .47 ERA in those three starts. If Ramsey keeps this up, there's no telling what he'll help his team do in the remainder of this season. Maybe we'll see them back in a ranked spot sooner rather than later. Ramsey has been killing it this season, as have the Dirty Terps. I mean, they did just fall out of the top 25, but it's a long season ahead. I don't think anyone should be worried. I think we'll see them back in. Yeah, you're right. I mean, they can't do what they've done without the guys on the bump like Ramsey. He's been playing out of his mind, really chucking them here at the Bob. Absolutely. And Major League hitters have been visiting College Park, and they're coming here to work with Maryland baseball assistant coach Matt Swope. TLB TV's Shane Connick gives us a closer look at Swope, who's becoming one of the premier hitting coaches in the country. Lamont Wade is home. The San Francisco Giants outfielder has been coming back to College Park to work with his college hitting coach, Matt Swope. Me and Swope have de developed such a great relationship when I was here at school at University of Maryland, and it just really carried over into pro ball. Wade had a breakout year for San Francisco in 2021, finding success in clutch moments as his Giants finished the regular season with the best record in baseball. He says he had that year because of Swope. Everything's about relationships, and that's one of the things, regardless of how good he was or, or now that he's with the Giants, we would still have a good relationship. Swope is one of the premier hitting coaches in the country. The UMD alumnus has been coaching at his alma mater for nearly eight years. All throughout the year, I mean, we're constantly texting, FaceTiming. Anytime uh, I had a question, he's always there to, to help and answer. Something pretty important to Coach Swope with hitting is stability, keeping your cord all that stable. So, one of the things he does is got this thing here, it's water in it. Stand here completely straight, hold this down, and then basically you want to drive and then bring that up. So that, that way, keeping sure that your core is still stable. Swope says being a coach is like being an artist sometimes, having a different canvas for each situation. Way's just glad he's able to spend some time with this artist, coming back home to build a better foundation. For the Left Bench TV, I'm Shane Connor. You know, Wade had a great season last year. It was really cool to see that. And it's cool to see him come back to College Park, learn from Swope, and Come back to where he's from. Yeah, they're in the hitting cage right on campus here. I mean, it's great to see guys like Wade and Brandon Lau really kill it in the MLB. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. But, Katie, Maryland softball had better luck on the road this weekend than the baseball team, huh? They did. That's right, Kevin. And better yet, it was in their Big Ten opener. The Terps traveled to Happy Valley where things looked dim at first, falling 2-1 to one in a 10-inning game on Thursday, but took Friday and Saturday to secure the series win. Maryland dominated the Nittany Lions 8-3 on Friday and then brought home a 6-4 dub to close it out. The Terps answered a two-run homer with four runs of their own in the top of the third inning. Penn State came back in the bottom of the third to tie it at four, but the Terps retook the lead in the top of the fourth, adding two runs from Kylie Goff and Megan McCommy. The defense held Penn State scoreless for the rest of the game, allowing only one hit and coming back home to College Park with the series win. The Terps now stand at 15 and 15, just at 500 on the season, and will host Iowa for a weekend series starting up this Friday at 6 p.m. TLB's Ryan Colasanti will have the coverage from the Maryland Softball Stadium.
And students may have been gone for spring break, but that doesn't mean your favorite Terps weren't making big plays over the past week. Absolutely, and so let's not waste any more time and let's get into our top five plays of the week. Kevin, start us off. All right, at number five, it's Maxwell Costas. We just saw this one sending one straight out of the park and getting the Terps on the board in the second. Like we said earlier, it was the senior's 33rd career homer. You can always count on that guy for a big hit. And at four, it's the vault queen herself, Alexis Rubio, sticking her landing with ease at the Big Ten Championships. She's been so solid all season, and those flips are even cooler to watch in slow-mo. And now at number three, we've got Hannah Lubecker dodging a double team to find the back of the net. JMU's defense tried and failed to scramble and stop the score, but we all know Stopping Hannah Lubecker is no easy task. No, it is not. And we also all know Bretton Makar is a force to be reckoned with on defense. But I guess now we can't count him out on offense either. Your number two play is Makar finding his first career goal against reigning national champs Virginia. What a day and season for the senior. And it was so nice, we got to watch it twice. And now for number one, our top play of the week is from who else but third team All-American Angel Reese. Watch as the women's basketball star gives the Stanford defender the business on her way to the rim. You can't guard me, she says. And Reese may be nominated as our pro trip sometime in the future, but this week we're going with a guy who walked this campus not too long ago, Charlotte FC rookie Ben Bender. Bender made his MLS debut a few weeks ago and has since made three starts. Last Tuesday, he did exactly what he did many times in a Maryland uniform, send one past the goalie. It was Bender's first career goal and Charlotte's first win in club history. Well, the collegiate athletic community was rocked by the loss of Stanford women's soccer goalie, Katie Meyer, who took her own life in early March. Athletes across the nation were hit hard by this news. Our Alexa Wootwin took a look at the responses seen from athletes following Katie's passing, including one right here in College Park, and how student athletes can find help for their mental health. First, the world lost a bright soul. Star Stanford women's soccer goalie Katie Meyer tragically took her own life. Meyer faced mental health challenges and struggled with perfectionism. She's not the only student athlete who has battled stress, anxiety, or depression. And she's not the first collegiate athlete to take her own life because of it. I personally did not know her, but I know that her story did touch not only me, but it touched a lot of other athletes. After Meyer's death, college athletes across the country spoke up on social media, including Maryland softball's Taylor Liguori. They want the mental health stigma in college athletics to end. I felt that if I came out and shared a little bit about my story, then maybe even if I just inspired one person to share something. My goal really was just to to let people know that they're not alone and that, you know, hopefully they can inspire someone else to, to speak up and, and help break this, this stigma that people don't want to talk about. Athletes weren't the only ones to speak up. Mental health advocates did as well. The Hidden Opponent is an organization that was founded in 2019 by USC volleyball alumna Victoria Garrick. It strives to create a platform for athletes struggling with mental health to share their stories. To hear that we lost another one was heartbreaking. It was really crazy timing to have heard the news of Katie. And while I was grieving that in a lot of ways that night, I also found myself at this amazing awareness game for the Hidden Opponent. So it was really awesome to kind of have that all come together and remind us why we do what we do. Meyer's family is now working with an opponent to carry on her legacy. Here at Maryland, athletic sports psychologists focus on providing mental health services for their athletes so that they can seek help if they need it. How? Mostly just by being present. Student athletes might have a mentality, you know, I got to this place because I, I didn't admit my weaknesses, so in some ways that might make it harder to voice that they're going through something difficult. And as a result, then they may not seek the help, whether it's from a mental health professional like myself or from just their peers, coaches, or family. Maryland sports psychologists also sponsor a program called SAMS, the Student Athlete Mentor Program, where current student athletes are trained to become advocates for mental health and help connect their peers with the resources they may need. We're trying to normalize our presence in athletics, sports like services, and, and to normalize that mental health difficulties are a normal thing and that it's, it's an okay thing to talk about. We want to thank Alexa for telling that story and extend our thoughts and prayers to Katie's family and friends. Yeah, it is encouraging to see that there are people reaching out to struggling college athletes, though. Yeah. And, well, that does it for this edition of the Left Bench TV. Be sure to keep up with all of our coverage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at the Left Bench. We'll see you next time.